One of the things that we have always tried to do um, at the AZ Bio Expo is make sure that we are including in our discussion not just the innovators and the deliveries, but also the patients and the patient advocacy groups that um, have such a big um, impact on the various things that we do to help patients. So, um, it's with my with great pleasure that I introduce you to um, one of my partners of the legislature um, and a fellow CEO in this space, Greg Vador, who is with the Arizona Hospital and Healthcare Association, and he is going to be leading our panel. So, Greg, it's all yours. All right. Thank you so much. It's really good to be here, a great event to be part of, and really looking forward to learning about how we can take the video that you saw at lunch and turn it into action. So I think we're trying to channel that I'm in video now and say, how do we really make sure that this really is about patients and that we're connecting them in particular to clinical trials? So really honored to be doing this, again, to be part of the event, but also uh, personally, a lot of my healthcare experience is actually trying to work with uh, individuals and, and making patient-centered care and it's part of what our hospital association is all about. We have a saying on our board that it's above all else put the patient first and I think the type of work we're going to talk about today is doing exactly that. So let me briefly uh, point out who's who on the panel and then we're going to do a fast introduction round. To my far right is Barbara Cavanaugh. Um, right next to me on the right is Brian Brown. Uh, Marsha Horn is to my left and Clayton Henke uh, to my far left. And we're going to start over here with you, Barbara, and it's going to be the, uh, no more than a couple minutes just about who you are and what you do and why you're passionate about bringing people into healthcare. Don't worry, I'm not going to read all of this. Barbara Cavanaugh, founder and CEO of Arizona Myeloma Network. Myeloma is M-Y-E-L-O-M-A. And I had to start saying that for many years because 24 years ago, my husband was diagnosed with multiple myeloma. And that is how we started our cancer journey. I'm happy to report we'll be celebrating 24 years of marriage and myeloma next week. But I'm here because Arizona Myeloma Network is a 501c3 charity. And what we do is awareness, education, and advocacy. And what we find is by reaching out to patients and families and bringing them together with outstanding leaders in both research and all kinds of healthcare services, that we can help patients have better results. And we are passionate about clinical trials and research. And I'll be talking later about what we would like to do to help researchers be more successful in having people participate in clinical trials. Thank you. Thanks, Barbara. Brian? Brian Brown from Banner Research. Uh, Banner Health has a research component, which is a four-pronged animal. First, there's the Banner Alzheimer's Institute, which does Alzheimer's research. Secondly, there's the Banner Sun Health Research Institute, which does research in Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. Uh, thirdly, there's the Banner MD Anderson Cancer Center, which does cancer research. And then we have hospital-based research clinical trials in all of our hospitals in the seven states which Banner Health operates in. So um, we have uh, a number of disease states that we research, but primarily um, Alzheimer's focused. And we're part of the Arizona Alzheimer's Consortium as well. And uh, part of our task and part of our journey is to be able to provide tomorrow's medicine today via clinical trials. And it's the conundrum of how do we get the patients to be able to, uh, to make that happen. And that's uh, where my job comes in as uh, what I do, and I'll be talking about that throughout the discussion. Clayton will let you use it. Hi there. Hi there. My name is Marsha Horn. I'm a patient advocate and CEO of ICANN, the International Cancer Advocacy Network based in Phoenix. We've been pretty much under the radar screen except to our target population of stage four patients. In fact, we're running waiting lists right now. Uh, we deal with patients not only in Arizona, but across the United States and 53 countries at last count, not including the island of Kiribati and, and Kurdistan. 
So you may know us, those of you from U of A and ASU, because in 1998, uh, we spearheaded and brought on as sponsors Barbara Leff and Susan Gerard, who were then in the house, the $10 million uh, appropriation bill that was signed into law by Governor Jane D. Hull and ended up essentially funding U of A to the tune of $7 million, uh, ASU and the Cancer Research Institute headed by Bob Pettit to the, to the tune of $2 million and, and the rest was divvied up amongst medical centers and scientists uh, throughout the state. That was the Arizona Anti-Cancer Drug Discovery and Drug Development Project. So in addition to patient advocacy, we have from time to time um, crusades in the state legislature and uh, in 2000 we were back at the state legislature wanting to have uh, the fruits of the major labs, U of A, ASU, NAU, uh, and their drug discoveries, the royalties and licensing from those discoveries pumped back into those universities to be used for additional drug discoveries. We're still working on that. So thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Clayton Hinkey. I'm with IBM, uh, IBM Watson Health. It's a new business unit for IBM that we announced a couple weeks ago at HIMSS, a uh, couple billion dollar investment specifically focused around bringing uh, deep analytics and cognitive computing to uh, the world of healthcare from an industry standpoint, something uh, that I think you'll see from IBM in terms of transforming um, the way we look at the marketplace, shifting more from a, a typical hardware, software services view to more of an integrated business unit focused uh, specifically in industries um, and in particular domain areas such as analytics and security. So I've been in Watson uh, as part of the Watson Group for a year and this new, uh, new business unit is taking our healthcare life sciences team uh, from around IBM bringing us together as an integrated business unit uh, focused on delivering uh, market solutions. And specifically, I have clinical trial matching uh, responsibility globally for, for Watson Health. So super excited to be here, uh, bringing clearly a, a uh, technology industry uh, perspective, uh, but not a practitioner perspective. So very interested to have uh, this conversation. Thanks for having us. All right. Thanks to you all for being here. Are you ready to go to work? Okay. So let's channel that video again. We're, uh, we got that person jogging down the street and suddenly there's some other people joining them and they say, well, you know, I don't just want to jog. I actually want to do something in terms of a clinical trial. Um, so maybe we can start with uh, Marsha and Barbara about if they have a question about how they can get in a clinical trial, what's the right one for me? How, I imagine you do some practical work trying to help people match up. Could you just explain to us how you do that? Barbara, you want to take it first? I want to also say thank you to Joan Kerber Walker for inviting me to be here. And I say that because I think that the patient perspective with, I, again, is very much Marcia and my perspective, is that most people don't even know what a clinical trial is. I, I started out when I began uh, Arizona Myeloma Network is because myeloma is a rare and they call it an often Orph orphan disease, and I was really interested in finding out more information about it. I was fortunate to meet uh, Dr. Fonseca at Mayo and John Carpton at Tijin. But what I realized was that I wasn't the only one who didn't know what a clinical trial was. About 90% of the other patients and families that I was meeting did not know what they were. They did not know how to access them. And they also had questions like, um, does it hurt when they take tissue? They pictured big hunks of them being taken from their body. I don't know if you've heard some of these kind of statements, but I mean, that was what I found was that people really did not understand clinical trials, tissue donation, research. And I'll turn it over to Marcia because you have a broader experience in that. Well, Barbara, I echo your comments and especially the salute to Joan Corber Walker. Uh, she is without question our tireless unsung hero, and, I, and we sing her praises, all of us today. She's been at the vanguard for ICANN 
on behalf of AZ Bio, not only on access to oral therapeutics, not only on prescriber communication on biosimilars, but the whole essence of clinical trials, which she knows better than anybody in the country, as you saw with her superb uh, presentation. So Joan, what you've done in terms of galvanizing the Arizona biomedical community is second to none, and I, I think we can stop apologizing for not being like San Diego or Boston. I think we're there, and I, I think uh, the reality of, of the reflection of the fact that we're there will come much more quickly than many of us uh, think. But getting back to the clinical trials connection, there's not a day that goes by where we're not connecting a stage four patient to the subject of trials in general and specific trials for their exact uh, diagnosis. We work with uh, our Physicians Advisory Council, led by Robert Tamas, who's with us today. We work with a Scientific Advisory Council, a Biomarkers Council, a Radio Genomics Council, everything. We operate in tumor board fashion on the very details of, of those patient cases. And Barbara, there is nothing more scandalous than the present state of affairs where the typical oncology patient, and most of the country's patients are, are handled by community oncology clinics, and many are superb, but many are not telling patients about specific clinical trials, and they're not even telling patients about the general subject of clinical trials. And we've seen the same problem pertain in major famous comprehensive cancer centers where we have patients in those centers and you would expect the discussion on specific clinical trials to take place, but it isn't. That's the kind of national scandal we're hoping to change at ICANN, and because of Dr. Robert Tamas, we've come up with a, a project called Remission Coach, which hopefully will be a change of paradigm in terms of connecting patients to clinical trials. So um, before we get to Brian and Clayton, you're going to be up soon enough. I want to dig a little bit deeper because I get there's a gap in even understanding what they are and there's barriers in the system to getting in. Is there a magic formula, magic words, magic services that really close the gap? What can we be doing to help move this along? And we'll start with you again, Barbara. I appreciate that. I appreciate that question because that is something that I began to identify uh, when I started ACMN uh, 11 years ago, is that if I, who was so interested, actually had good doctors like the doctors at Mayo, if I didn't know and was ever being asked or told anything about research clinical trials, then there obviously were a lot of other people. But I think something that was really interesting is the kind of collaboration that you're expressing, Marcia, and that I found is that as a cancer patient advocate and research advocate, I found that the research community that I was talking to were really glad that I was asking these questions. And so I started doing our annual Living with Myeloma Conference and Research Roundtable. That was one of the ways I began to reach out to the broader physician community, uh, institutional community, and of course, having patients have a chance to actually ask questions about clinical trials. And I think, you know, again, it's a slow process, but now we've been doing these, we're going to have our 10th conference and roundtable, and we bring researchers from all over the country because we want new ideas. And we always have uh, at least one seminar on clinical trials and how people can find out about them. So we're trying, and another important thing, and we can talk more about it later, is uh, with the help of TGen and Virginia Piper and Mayo, um, we developed a program in 2007 called Tissue Donor Awareness Program, TDAP. And the purpose is and was to try and come out into the community, doing it at the library, doing it at Glendale Community College, uh, and inviting people in the community to come and hear about all cancers, all clinical trials, not just about myeloma. So that's a beginning to try and address some of this gap. Okay. Marcia, magic formula from you? 
the magic formula has to be uh, that the subject of clinical trials gets raised in virtually every oncology appointment. That's what we counsel our patients to do from the very first opportunity because the landscape of clinical trials is going to change for that patient over the course of their treatment. So we always have to think of issues like clinical trials, issues such as compassionate use for each patient as they go through their journey with cancer. I was trying to think of during Joan's presentation about Tennessee, what is it about ICANN's Tennessee patients that is, is so different? And it's easy. Almost every Tennessee-based patient that's come to ICANN for advocacy services since our founding in 1997 has been absolutely up to speed on the subject of clinical trials in general and clinical trials with specificity to their condition. There's Vanderbilt, there's Sarah Cannon Research Institute, there's Tennessee Oncology. Clearly there is a culture and an ethos there that says we're talking about clinical trials in this state and we've got to replicate that here. We have an extremely sophisticated oncology community in Arizona. In fact, if you turn on Masterpiece Theater or any cable news network, all you're going to see is seven or eight different cancer centers advertising their services. It's a sophisticated community, and it's on the ball in many, many ways. We just have to add clinical trials to that matrix. So Brian, I just met you two minutes before this panel started, but I'm willing to bet you're a good guy in this matchmaking. And so maybe you could share a little bit of what you do and how you start to fill the gap from the point of view of the Banner Health System. So there's, uh, there are a lot of clinical trials to be filled. And um, there are certain other considerations that, that are in play as well that a lot of folks don't know. For example, um, for federally funded clinical trials now, the NIH has put a mandate that 20% of your participants have to be minority participants. Uh, this is part of the, the I'm in strategy, but there's a big leap to assume that um, you're going to get the same kind of participation from your minority um, participants as you would from the majority population. So to be able to fill the gap and to be able to understand it in its entirety, it all really boils down to relationships. You have to be and have a concerted effort to build relationships across the board. Um, people, when you have a relationship with them or an organization or a group, are more apt to listen to your message. And specifically in minority communities, um, it's akin to dating. Uh, there's some people who go out in the dating world who um, just want a one-night stand. So they give a line to somebody and all of a sudden they're hoping that that materializes that night and you get basically somebody to, uh, to bite on that. And, and there's a lot of clinical trials organizations that just basically go into a situation where they're looking to, I showed up, will you be a part of my clinical trials? Where it takes a relationship, it's almost dating taking your relationship to the next level, explaining what it's about, and then not, you don't only get them, but you get their families. You get their extended families and everything like that. So to invest in a relationship with communities and people and do the education pieces that we heard about before are key strategies in being able to have people have the, the confidence and the knowledge of what, uh, what's transpiring in the clinical trials arena. Thanks. Let me get Clayton involved in this because I think it would be an interesting counterpoint. You're talking about relationships and one night stands. I don't imagine you date Watson, but uh, we look at technology and believe it's certainly influencing our lives, but we like to believe it's a, it's a path to a solution, including issues like that. And I'm sure that that's part of why you're here is to help us understand how we might be able to, to work with technology to fill this gap and to make the world work better. How, how about if you explain a little bit how you're thinking about an IBM to, to make a difference in this area for patients? No, I'd certainly be happy to, Greg. Um, I think it's a super, super topic, great question. Um, and as I moved into the, the healthcare space probably about six months ago and I transitioned around Watson, one of the first uh, statistics that, that was shared with me, and frankly was shared by uh, folks at the Mayo Clinic that we're working with, they said there's somewhere around 20% of patients are actually eligible for trials. But on average, we enroll less than 5%. Right? So part of our, our thought is how can we help make that, uh, make that enrollment uh, accrual rate improvement, help to bring trials and patients together, and 
to do that it, probably from, from two, uh, two angles. One from a, a provider angle, which I think is, is largely um, the conversation here, but also uh, from the sponsor. So on the provider side, what we're doing with technology and using the Watson cognitive capability to, to go against large volumes of structured, unstructured data that's in the patient EMR records, as well as uh, in the protocol itself, and being able to um, not only read, but also to understand it in context, context of a particular disease indication. Right? And so we've been working with, with Mayo to train Watson on breast, lung, and colorectal cancers as our first four to start with, um, and expanding through oncology and into other disease states. But what we're looking to do is at the, the point of care, that point of consultation, to enable on oncologists to have a conversation, to be able to use Watson to uh, inform the diagnosis, be able to provide an access to volumes of literature, which would be difficult to, uh, to consume as an individual and understand all possible um, uh, sets of uh, experience and evidence that's out there. But it, uh, at the point of looking at the, the standard of care, also be able to look at a clinical trial alternative path and bring in clinical trial matching as a uh, technology avenue to, to explore during the consultation. So uh, that, that's one area of Watson. And, and the other side really is to, uh, a lot of the trials fail to enroll, right? And we've got a, a fairly significant trial failure rate overall. Um, certainly over 50% of them are just delayed in terms of execution. Costs money, takes time for drugs to get to market uh, and close that loop. So uh, from the sponsor side, we're, we're doing two things. We're trying to help uh, make the overall protocol more executable, optimize it, reduce the, the number of amendments, try to get it to be more feasible from an execution standpoint, and then also from a site placement. So where can you optimize the placement so that you can hit the accrual rates quicker, more completely, and more effectively execute? And so both trying from the, the drug side to make the trial more consumable, the patient side to actually match it through. Meeting in the middle, Right? And uh, as Brian was saying, and trying to get um, the broader relationships to align is, is really going to be the, the key point. And if we can successfully achieve that uh, across the country and globally, I think it will change the, the course and trajectory here. So I'm hearing a, a combination of mining big data for opportunities and mm -hmm. using best practices. And that is the beginning of some of the changes going on right. in healthcare and finding mm -hmm. the opportunities. And um, Yes, we're going to let you comment, but actually I want to hear, I assume that's a lot of what Banner is doing too, so if that's what you want to comment yes. on, you're right on track. So uh, informatics is really where we're headed to next. Um, we have a number of employed physicians within our, our Banner system who have obviously access to all the electronic medical records from patients from primary care all the way up. So when a patient may identify that they are potentially eligible for a clinical trial. We have to build into that informatic system a way that these physicians then enter into the conversation of what may be eligible and, and send them down the continuum. Informatics is going to be extremely important as we go forward, but we have to get everybody on the same platform. We have uh, Banner Medical Group, we have uh, Banner Health Network, and we have now our University of Arizona Physicians, which we d just came on board. And so we have to align the networks so that they all talk to each other so we can have the same platform where informatics makes sense. But uh, informatics is going to be the next wave in terms of point of service at your primary care and other specialties to be able to integrate clinical trials uh, for patients that come to us. So Barbara, Marsha, informatics. Best practice approaches, are you feeling warm and fuzzy? Good about the future? Tell us how you react to that. And is this a good development? Does it need to be massaged to make it work in your world? It's the pivotal development, and it's increasingly part of our world. I think what you're accomplishing with Watson and what I can and Dr. Bob Tamas um, are accomplishing through our project called Remission Coach plays to exactly the overarching need, which is expediting the process and preventing the screen fails, encouraging enrollment to begin with, and then once you have enrollment, encouraging retention. And what I'd like to see us do is maybe per perhaps work together because Watson needs the patient voice early on in the process. If we can integrate the sophisticated patient advocate and the sophisticated patient voice 
in the protocol design process, we will have less failures in terms of trial design and more successes in terms of capturing vitally important patient reported outcomes and outcomes of importance to patients, that, that they could walk maybe four more steps and that four more steps liberates them from having to be assisted going to find a bathroom. So things that are important to patients have, have often not been part of protocol design and they've got to be now and I think Watson uh, will be a huge advance and I think what we're doing with Remission Coach can also be a paradigm shift so that patients are co uh, connected to trials more expeditiously, trials perform and are more successful and thus the tremendous promise of the biopharmaceutical industry and the tremendous accomplishments of that industry can be felt by the patient world faster and we're all patients, so it's going to benefit all of us. I want to add to what Marcia said. Because I started a grassroots charity, and I'm of an age that I'm not as technically competent, um, I think the resources that I'm seeing here already could be a tremendous uh, help for an organization like mine. I think there's really a need for multiple patient advocacy groups and programs. None of us can do it alone. But one of the things I'm hearing about is, for the most part, you're so busy doing what you're doing, I'm so busy doing what I'm doing. We often don't have an opportunity to sit down with some of the other stakeholders. And I think the critical point you made, and that I really believe in, is the patient advocate, particularly in cancer, needs to be included. That's not always the patient. Very often it's the caregiver. And I realized over 24 years of my marriage is that I really have been a full-time caregiver. And my husband has been an excellent patient. <laughs> but the reality is that so much of my life has been absorbed in his journey and that people like me cancer caregivers are a very, very valuable resource, both for the end product or the resource that we're talking about, research, but also because very often it is they who are driving the patient to the, you know, the hospital or the clinic. They are the ones who are making sure all the medications are taken on time. And um, apropos of that, about five years ago, I designed with some of my consultants a program called the Cancer Caregivers Education and Support Program. Because what I realized is that we were very critical to the effectiveness. Often patients were ready to drop out of the clinical trials they were in because it was too hard for their spouse, they needed transportation, and so on. So trying to get the, what I call, the other kinds of pieces together to help the patient and the family navigate the system is another piece of what all of us need to be not only dialoguing about, but building processes. And we, as an organization, really need to have that kind of technical guidance and, and an opportunity to sit in on that you know, planning of that process you know, to help be part of that voice. So I think this is exciting just sitting here. So I thank you. So Clayton, my experience with tech companies is they're very good at involving the end users in developing products. And I, I think you're going to get the last word on this panel. This has been the fastest half hour in the history of healthcare in Arizona. So some thoughts about how to incorporate some of what you're hearing from Marsha and Barbara about where you're going with Watson and informatics and best practices. Yeah. Well, OK, so I think we do get, uh, get the end here. I, one, as we've, we've talked through with, um, with the sponsors, both on CRO and Pharma side and on the provider side, um, what's clear is that it, there's a, a huge opportunity, there's a huge need, um, there's a lot of very interested stakeholders, um, but bringing the different groups together in, in a way which is, is manageable at scale. So we can bring a provider and a CRO together. We can help facilitate different things. But to be able to do it at the scale of the US population, of a global population, um, to be able to offer uh, programs and a level of care that we enjoy here 
in Thailand, for instance, or in India, and we're having conversations today with some of how we've scaled or, or trying to scale human expertise with work we did with MSK for Bamangrad on medical tourism around oncology. So it, it, putting technology not in a, in a position to replace, but to actually to enhance the care that we can provide, I think is, is where we're headed. Um, we hope that Watson Health will be the catalyst um, to, to bridge a lot of the, the gaps. So I'm just going to sum it up since I'm being told to stop that we have to think global and act local. I think I've heard that somewhere else, but uh, I think all we have left to do is uh, time to thank our panelists for being here and sharing their thoughts. Thank you. <laughs>